Hello, uh, welcome to my iBiology seminar. My name is Yunong Jen. I'm a professor at the University of California, uh, San Francisco. I'm also an investigator with Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Today, I would like to discuss dendrimorphogenesis. Uh, our brain has uh, billions of neurons, and a typical neuron has three major compartments. Uh, they are the dendrites. Uh, dendrite, uh, this word is derived from the Greek word dendro, means tree. And so these are the tree-like structure. Dendrites are used by neurons to receive signals. The signal could be a sensory stimuli, such as a light or heat, uh, or it could be synaptic input. There's the cell body, where the nucleus resides, and then exon propagates the uh, signal from dendrite toward the uh, exon terminal to release transmitters, which can either inhibit or excite the target cell. Depends on the transmitter. So, but most of neurons don't actually look like this uh, generic neuron. Uh, in fact, the, the neuron, the dendrite morphology of neuron is extremely diverse as illustrated by those drawings uh, of uh, Ramani Cajal. Cajal was a, a, a founder of modern neuroscience. He was a great scientist, but he was also a remarkable artist. So he made thousands and thousands of exquisite drawings uh, by visualizing neurons with Golgi stand. And so from this uh, drawing, you can see that the Dendrite morphology is very diverse, and yet is neuronal type specific. So given that dendrite morphology is uh, not only a distinguishing uh, hallmark of a neuron, but it's also important for neuronal signaling. So it's important to understand how each neuron develops its uh, neuronal type specific dendrite morphology. Um, we, when we started studying this problem about 20 years ago, very little was known. And uh, uh, so, so for me, uh, I was attracted to this problem because it's not only scientifically important, but also for its aesthetics. Uh, because uh, dendrites are among the most beautiful structure in biology. And just look at this really spectacular dendritic arbor of a Purkinje cell. My talk has uh, two parts. In the first part, I'll discuss uh, how a neuron develops its neuronal type specific dendritic morphology. And because uh, to really understand dendrite morphogenesis, we need to know the relationship between uh, morphology and function. So in the second part, I'll discuss the relationship of uh, uh, morphology and function and then uh, uh, talk about the cellular and molecular basis of dendrite morphogenesis. So uh, how, how does one study a daunting problem like dendrite morphogenesis? So we took the tried and true uh, approach of choosing a simple, relatively simple model system that is suited for the problem. And uh, that is the uh, group of Drosophila larval sensory neurons. The uh, Drosophila has a very good track record as a model system for studying a variety of very fundamental biological problems. And uh, uh, part of the reason is that uh, there are great genetic tools developed by the fly community over the years. And so, um, our brain has uh, billions of neurons, uh, and uh, the, those neurons probably can be divided into thousands of different types. And actually, no one knows how many different types of neurons we have. By comparison, the nervous system of Drosophila is quite a bit simpler. And an adult neur uh, Drosophila has uh, about a million neurons. And the juvenile form of, of Drosophila, of fly, uh, the larva, that those are even simpler. So even though the nervous system of fly is much simpler than ours, but their neurons share many of the same properties and molecules with us. So by studying fly 
and what, what we can learn, some of them might be idiosyncratic or fly, but more often than not, what, what we can learn uh, can, can be uh, applicable to other animals, including humans. Okay. So this is the uh, life cycle of fly. And starting with uh, a, a fertilized egg, the embryogenesis takes about a day and then the lava hatches from uh, hatches, and it goes through goes through three stages or three instars. Uh, and, uh, during this period, the lava simply grows bigger, uh, but uh, maintain the same uh, body plan. And at the end of a uh, lava stage, the the lava pupae and goes through metamorphosis and emerge as a fly. Right here. So. Um, the, the, one of the very useful genetic tools for fly is there are thousands and thousands of uh, uh, Galfour lines that can be used to drive the expression of green fluorescence protein in just about any cell type you want to study and to visualize them. So here's an example. And the, we use a particular Galfour line which express GAP in a particular set of sensory neurons uh, like this. Uh, with, with the, those neurons are called class 4 DNA neuron. And this is uh, a subject of our study. And what you can see is that you can see those really beautiful uh, dendrites. Uh, and this is a living, behaving uh, animal. And so, so, so this, is a, this is a very useful tool because that allows us to uh, observe the development of this dendrite in real time in uh, living animals. Moreover, this will allow us to do experimental manipulation. For instance, like uh, ablate one of those neurons and, and look at the consequence, and I'll, I'll give an example later on. So the neuron we'll be studying are, the, uh, are called uh, the dendritic arborization or DNA neurons. They are part of the Drosophila larval periphery nervous system. The Drosophila is a PNS, it's organized in a bilaterally symmetric and a segmentally repeated pattern. So each hemisegment has 44 of those of sensory neurons. Among those 44 neurons, 15 are those DNA neurons that we will be studying. And the, uh, here is, uh, we see that the, those uh, 15 DNA neurons can be divided into four different classes, class one to four. So there are three class one neurons, uh, four class two neurons, uh, five class three neurons, and three class four neurons. And, and the, the shaded area you can see for each one of these, uh, that indicates the, uh, the territory uh, uh, that's uh, covered by the dendritic opera of each of those neurons. Those four classes of neurons have uh, distinct dendritic morphology. So from class one, which has the simplest uh, dendritic morphology, to class four, which has the most elaborate dendritic opera. And so our task now then is to, we have four classes of neuron, and we want to explain how does each class of those neuron gets their type specific than GT upper. Yeah. So uh, like any complicated biological process, dendrite morphogenesis is uh, regulated by both intrinsic factors and extrinsic factors. So for the intrinsic factors, Several transcription factors have been found to have important role in controlling dendrite morphogenesis. And so I'll uh, just uh, give you one example about the function of a gene called CUT, uh, which I think is informative. So CUT is a uh, homeobus containing transcription uh, factor. And when Wes Gruber was a postdoc in our lab, uh, he noticed that the level of cut expression uh, correlates with the uh, neuronal cell type. So you see that class one, which has no cut, 
class 2 has low level of card, class 4 has intermediate level of card, and class 3 has high level of card. So Wes wonders whether the level of cut may regulate the complexity of the dendrite in a cell type specific manner. And so to test his idea, first he asked what would happen if he removed cut from uh, different classes of neuron. So here we look at a class 4 neuron, and the, the normal class 4 neuron has this very large dendritic arbor. And, but uh, if, uh, if uh, West removes cut from uh, class 4 neuron, you see the dendritic upper becomes much smaller. And, and the dendrite branching pattern is also simplified. Likewise, if he did the same experiment with class 3 neuron, again, uh, removing cut uh, sort of reduces the size of dendritic upper. Moreover, uh, class 3 neurons has a unique structure they have those uh, short uh, protrusions, which uh, we call dendritic spike. That's, that's uh, unique for class 3 neuron. And it's, they are used for uh, mechanical transduction. I'll come back to that later on. And so by removing cut, uh, this uh, special class 3 spe specific structure uh, disappeared. So by reducing cut, we see that uh, it reduces the complexity of the dendrite. And moreover, the, this uh, uh, unique class 3 specific structure, those little spikes, disappeared. Okay. So West then did the Congress experiment. He asked what would happen now if he uh, overexpressed cut in a cell, that, in a neuron that normally does not have cut. So in this experiment, on the uh, left side, you see it's a class 1 neuron, which has simple dendritic branching pattern. Now, on the right-hand side, what he did is he took a class 1 specific alpha driver, so he can drive the expression of cut to high level, comparable to that uh, in the class 3 neuron. And then you see this quite dramatic effect. Uh, First of all, the dendrite becomes more complex and dendritic upper gets bigger. Moreover, now you see that those uh, dendritic spikes, the class 3 unique structure, specific structure, uh, appear in this converted dendrite. And moreover, uh, if he did the same thing with a class 4 neuron by boosting the level of cutting class 3, 4 neuron, it can also uh, uh, change the dendrite property into that of class 3 neuron. So to summarize then, the uh, cut seems to function as a multi-level regulator of dendrite morphology, as, as if, if you dial in the level of cut, you can influence the complexity and the property of the dendrite. Okay. Now, is the cut function uh, evolutionally conserved? And there's some evidence for that. So first, that uh, the experiment I just described a moment ago, by uh, ectopically expressing cut in class 1 neuron can convert the dendrite into the class 3 specific uh, type of dendrite. So Wes asked, uh, if we, instead of the Drosophila cut, uh, what if we do the same experiment, but instead we use the human, uh, human homolog of cut? Um, so you put a human uh, homolog cut gene into class 1 neuron, and again, it can convert the class 1 dendrite into the class 3-like dendrite, both in the dendritic upper size and this uh, production of this special dendritic spike, and suggesting that cut has an uh, evolutionary conserved function. And moreover, uh, recently, uh, Chris Walsh's lab reported that the human homolog cuts one, and it has functions similar to that of cut. That is, there's a dosage-dependent effect on cuts one, dosage-dependent effect on the dendritic morphology, uh, depending on cuts one level. And uh, uh, as, as a study in the mammalian cortical neuron. Moreover, uh, from their sequencing study, 
they found there's a mutation in the enhancer region of Cas1 that caused uh, overexpression of Cas1 gene, and that would affect the dendrite morphology. And this mutation is strongly uh, associated uh, with uh, autism spectrum disorder. So uh, since um, the dendrite morphology is important for neuronal signaling, so it's not so surprising that mutations affecting the dendrite morphology, some of them uh, are found to uh, be linked to neurological disorders such as uh, autism. And I'll come back to this point uh, later on. Let's now return to the question of how does a neuron acquire its type-specific uh, dendritic morphology. So uh, let's now consider a class four neuron. So class four neuron has the most elaborate dendritic arbor. Moreover, the dendritic arbor of a class four neuron form a very regular uh, array that covers the entire body wall of, uh, of a lava. And so our test then is to understand how does class four neuron develop this elaborate dendritic arbor and how does this array develop. Okay. So, uh, I told you early on that the cut is one of the genes that can influence the dendritic morphology. Its level is a regular dendritic morphology. But cut is not enough. It's not the only transcription factor that influence dendritic arbor. And in fact, several, several here you can see the several transcription factors, they function uh, combinatorially to, uh, to specify the dendritic uh, property of each type of, uh, of uh, DNA neuron. So if you look at the class four neuron, it has a particular combination of these uh, three transcription factors. So what it seems is that those, combina this, those three transcription factors uh, instruct the cell, the class four cell, uh, that you, your job is to grow uh, as much as you can, fill all the available space, okay? And then the exact shape and branching pattern of this, uh, of this dendritic arbor is shaped and uh, regulated by four types of dendritic interactions. So I'll, I'll take you through these four, four different types of dendritic interaction. So the first dendritic interaction is the interaction between sister dendrites of the same neuron. So in general, they repel one another. Uh, this phenomena is known as self-avoidance. All four classes of DNA neurons show self-avoidance. So if you look at the dendritic branches, they tend not to bundle together and they don't cross over. And in fact, the self-avoidance seems to be a general property of most, if not all, neurons. If you look at the Cajal's drawing, this, uh, this uh, Purkinje cell, if you look closely, you can see that the uh, dendritic branches of Purkinje cells also show self-avoidance. They don't cross over, they don't bundle together. Okay. So, so presumably, self-avoidance allows the dendrite to spread out, and that's what you want uh, for, for antenna of a neuron. So uh, in Drosophila, self-avoidance is mediated by a molecule called DSCAN. It stands for Down syndrome cell adhesion molecule. And this uh, molecule was discovered by uh, Dima Schmucker when he was a postdoc in Larry Zabersky's lab. So the uh, DSCAN uh, belongs to the immunoglobulin superfamily. And this gene goes through extensive uh, alternative splicing. It's capable of producing uh, 38,000, uh, more than 38,000 isoforms. Uh, but all the isoforms have the same domain structure as shown here. Okay. So, so, I, so I'll first describe to you the uh, function of the SCAN in self-avoidance. And then later on, I'll discuss the uh, significance of the the, the, this locus can generate such large number of uh, uh, splice form, isoform. So let's uh, next look at the function of the SCAN. 
So uh, if we remove the SCAN, and then what happened is uh, it affects self-avoidance. And I'll, here I'll show class one neuron because they have simpler morphology, easier to, to see the phenotype. Uh, wild type class one neuron, you see, has a relatively simple dendritic arbor, and the dendritic branches sort of run in parallel. And, uh, but if you look at the mutant on the right-hand side, uh, then, then the dendrite, uh, many of them bundle together or cross over due to a lack of self-avoidance. And um, if you, so, so, but now if in, in a mutant where the entire DS cam uh, locus is removed, if you put back a, a randomly chosen single isoform that can rescue the phenotype, and we have done that for multiple single isoforms. In each case, we can rescue that phenotype. So what this experiment says is that for, for self-avoidance, you need at least one uh, uh, isoform, but which particular isoform is not important. Okay. Now, the second type of interaction that patterns then drives uh, is uh, is uh, the repulsion between dendrites or neighboring neurons of the same type. And so let, let's again look at class four dendrite. And here in a mature third instar larva, uh, we look from the, uh, from the dorsal side down. And what you can see is that the, the class four dendrite makes a very regular pattern and with sharp border between adjacent neurons. And we artificially uh, color in the dendritic arbor just to illustrate how regular the pattern is. And so this pattern is like tiles that cover in the floor. So this phenomenon is known as tiling. And tiling was actually uh, initially discovered in mammalian retina. And, and so its function presumably is to ensure complete and non-redundant coverage of a receptive field. So how does uh, so how does tiling develop? So for that we need to look at the development of the DNA neuron. So the DNA neuron they are born during mid embryogenesis, and uh, as I mentioned, through the combination of three transcription factors, uh, they, the the instructed neuron newborn neuron to start grow, growing dendrite and to try to fill as much space as they can. And so, so early on, you see the, the uh, class 4 neuron, they, they grow out their dendrite, they spread out because there's a self-avoidance uh, mechanism. They grow until at the beginning of second instar when they meet up with their neighbor. And at that point, you can see they repel one another, and that's how they set up this uh, sharp border. We know there's this repulsion because uh, of the this experiment. Uh, so in this experiment, what we did is to ablate one of these class four neurons early in development. And then uh, this, this, as I said, is one of the very nice feature of this uh, experimental system. You can see those neurons uh, ever since they, they, they're born. And so you can do manipulations like uh, ablate a particular neuron. So, so when you do that, what you see is that the neighboring dendrites then invade the vacated territory. And this is what you would expect, uh, because uh, uh, in this case, then there's no neuron here to prevent the other neuron to send the dendrite to that territory. And, uh, and, and, and so that, that's how this uh, tile pattern is set up. And we, and I should, uh, mentioned two things. One is uh, we still don't know what this tiling signal is, so, so that's an important thing to discover. The other is that tiling phenomena, uh, I mentioned earlier, self-avoidance is a general property of essential all neurons, uh, but the tiling only, uh, only a subset of neurons has the tiling property, and there are other neurons, they, they don't do this. Okay. So uh, now let me talk about the third dendritic interaction. 
And that is the dendrites of neighbor neurons of different type now. And they, they should not repel one another. The reason for that is that often in the nervous system, you find that, uh, uh, that the dendrites from different neurons are packed in a very, uh, in a very uh, crowded space. And so they, they need to be able to coexist in, 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 in such a packed space. And DNA neurons show this property too. Let me, uh, let me uh, illustrate that. So here we look at class one neuron that's labeled in red. And green labels class four dendrite. And this is the superposition of two. So what you can see is that different type of neuron they can occupy the same space. They are really, really just uh, laying on top of each other. And so for, for, for this to work, they cannot uh, repel each other. So that means neurons need to have an ability to distinguish uh, self from non-self. Okay. And the, the key of this uh, property is the diversity of the s -can. So uh, early on, I mentioned that for self-avoidance to occur, all you need is a single isoform right, of the s -can. Then you may wonder, why don't all neurons just use the same isoform, and that, that then self-avoidance will work? And that, that's fine for self-avoidance. But then it will, this will create a problem. Then when you have different neurons right, uh, stacked on each other, they will start repelling each other, and this will be inappropriate repulsion. And a little bit later on, I'll, I'll show you an experimental test of that. So the, the key to allow uh, different neurons to uh, occupy the same space is, the, is the, due to the property of the s -can, uh, the diversity of the s -can. So the s -can, uh, the, they show uh, isoform-specific homophilic binding. And, and so each ds can molecule has uh, a number of IgG domains. And, but, uh, but there are three variable regions, uh, two, three, and seven. And so now if we consider two dendrites next to each other, so the, the two dendrites, only if they have exactly the same variable domain, variable domain, the, then the, uh, the DS can, can interact with each other strongly, then leads to the repulsion of the dendrite. And if it's not a perfect match, then they don't, they don't bind, okay? Uh, this this uh, property is important, uh, you'll see in a minute. So now, uh, let's test the idea that uh, if all neurons use the same single isoform, it will create problem. And so the experiment is the following. And we have uh, in, in wild type, class one neuron in red and class four neuron in green, they, they overlap. But now if we create a mutant in which we delete the entire ds cam locus, but replace it with a single isoform under the uh, control of an endogenous promoter. So now we create a, a fly which has, has only one uh, ds cam isoform. When you uh, do that, what you see is in, in this mutant with only one isoform, the, uh, the area that normally occupied by the class one neuron, and now the class four dendrite cannot enter the area so, so that they start repelling each other. This is what I mean by inappropriate repulsion uh, to prevent uh, different neurons from occupying the same space. So the way this whole thing works is the following. So uh, it has been shown that each neuron typically would choose uh, about two dozens of isoforms from the 38,000 possible isoform, as this is done stochastically. And so now imagine you have two neighboring neurons. And so, so the one neuron will pick these two dozens of the isoforms out of 38,000. And the next neuron will do the same. Since it's done stochastically, the chance of them picking essentially the same set of 
uh, the SK isoform is very small. And that's what allows different neurons to occupy the same space. So, so the, for the SCAN, a single isoform is enough for self-avoidance. Uh, but for this uh, coexistence uh, of different neurons, you need the diversity. And so you can see the uh, the SCAN functions so like a barcode, letting one neuron uh, to distinguish itself from the other neuron. Okay. So so I have uh, told you that the 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 SCAN has this important function in dendrite pattern in fly. And what about mammalian nervous system? And it turns out the same logic is used, but, but, but different molecules uh, were, were also used. Okay. So in mammalian system, uh, instead of the SCAN, uh, another set of molecule called protocoherin uh, seems to be used for, the, for both self-avoidance and for distinguishing self from non-self. And this is based on the work primarily from the uh, labs of Josh Sands and Tom and the others. So there are 58 protocoherent genes. They can be divided into three clusters, and they are arranged uh, in a linear fashion. Okay. So from, for, from this, uh, one can generate 58 different protocoherent uh, proteins, uh, but uh, because the uh, protocoherent functions uh, as a heterotetramer, and so by mix and match, you can generate uh, uh, far greater varieties. And, and also, in addition, uh, just like the SCAN, uh, protocoherent shows uh, isoform specific homophilic adhesion, and also uh, protocoherents are expressed uh, stochastically and combinatorially in single neuron. So those properties are very similar to that of the SCAN, uh, allow it to function uh, for self-avoidance and for distinguishing self from non-self. So the function of protocoherent has been studied extensively in, uh, in the uh, starburst amacrine cells in the retina. And those cells, uh, like here, is, uh, is essentially confined in two dimensions. So it's very similar to the uh, DNA neuron. And just like DNA neuron, they show self-avoidance. The dendrite of this uh, neuron shows self-avoidance. But if you, in a mutant where they conditionally knock out all 22 protocoherent genes in the gamma cluster, now you see this very striking uh, self-avoidance phenotype. The, the dendrite bundled together, they show crossover. And this phenotype can be rescued if you put back one of the 22 uh, protocoherent uh, gamma gene. So this, again, is very similar to that of the X scan story, that a single isoform is sufficient for self-avoidance. Now, uh, what's the purpose of the diversity in this system? And uh, so it has been, just like the DSCAM story, it, it, this has been postulated that if you reduce the complexity, then the neuron will start to have inappropriate repulsion. And indeed, there's some evidence for that, but although that work is still in progress. So to summarize this part then, uh, we have uh, protocoherent in mammalian system and DS can in Drosophila system. Uh, they have similar function for self-avoidance and, and self and non-self discrimination. And they share the same property that they have large number of isoforms in each case. There's isoform specific homophilic uh, adhesion and they are expressed stochastically and combinatorially in single neurons. So, so same strategy, same logic, but different molecules. Because uh, protocoherent and DS can, uh, between them, there's no sequence homology, just two, two different uh, family of molecules. So uh, there's uh, one more interaction that's uh, important for patterning dendrite. So the dendrites can 
interact not only with other dendrites, but the dendrite can also interact with uh, non-neuronal cells. And, and uh, I'll give you an example. In the case of DNA neuron, uh, they, uh, they are confined uh, to, they are tethered to the extracellular matrix by, made by the uh, epithelial cell. And this tethering is important for self-avoidance and self non-self-discrimination. Uh, I'm sorry, for, for, for self-avoidance and for tiling to work. Uh, the reason is that the DNA neurons, they are essentially two-dimensional structure, and they are confined to two dimension by tethering to the extracellular matrix of the epithelial cell, epi made by epidermal cells, and via integrin. So if this adhesion is defective, what will happen then is when the den two dendrites get close to each other, and all they have to do is for one of them to grow in a slightly, uh, uh, in a slightly different plane along the z-axis, then they can avoid contacting one another, and so that would create what we call this uh, non-contacting uh, uh, crossing over. And, and, and so, uh, so, in fact, uh, the, beside integrin, there are a number of other molecules involved in this process. Uh, a student of mine, uh, Shen Meltzer, recently found that the, uh, that the, the, uh, the epidermal cells uh, secrete a signal molecule called SEMA2B, which is detected by dendrite by using the SEMA2B uh, receptor, plexin B. And then this functions through hippokinase pathway and integrin to tether the dendrite to the epidermal cell. So uh, to recap, uh, the, after the neuron is born, a particular combination of transcription factors tell the neuron to grow to fill all the space uh, that it can with its dendrite. Self-avoidance um, uh, allow them to spread out and until they meet with their neighbor. And then the tiling mechanism uh, would set up the border so, so that they, the neighboring cell will not uh, invade other cells' uh, territory. And for this to happen, uh, the neuron need to be confined to a two-dimensional space uh, by, by interacting with the uh, extracellular matrix made by the epidermal cell. And on top of that, between different neurons, they can coexist in the same space, and that requires the uh, diversity of the DS scan. So uh, in the next part, so you may wonder what's the point of uh, uh, setting up such a regular array. And in the next part, I'll uh, try to address that question. Uh, so this part of talk, first, I would like to thank the great student and poster who uh, did the work when they were in our lab. And Lily is my long-term collaborator. And we thank uh, HHMI, NIH, and NSF for funding. And thank you for listening.